Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Emerging Trends in Mortgage Litigation. This presentation will discuss in detail the growing areas of mortgage litigation, poor residential mortgage lending practices, and flawed mortgage funding structures were a significant cause of the downturn in the economy that began in 2007. Many of the assets and processes associated with certain types of mortgages have produced significant losses. Many, many entities and other parties associated with originating, funding, servicing, guaranteeing, insuring, and investment in certain mortgage assets are now parties to civil litigation. This includes mortgage brokers, loan officers, mortgage banking and servicing firms, banks, thrifts, credit unions, title insurance companies, closing, closing services, mortgage and bond insurance companies, government-sponsored mortgage entities, individual borrowers, sellers of mortgage real estate properties, and institutional investors. During today's program, our presenter will discuss the following issues. The history of, a, of changing underwriting risk parameters in residential mortgage lending, how changing standards led to a downturn in the housing market, the rise of subprime lending and how it affected prime mortgages, Alt-A and non-prime, contractual representations and warranties in sale of mortgages and mortgage-backed securities, repurchase demands, fraud and misrepresentation, borrowers and lenders, mortgage ownership transfer slash foreclosure problems, quality control and underwriting, credit score utilization in residential mortgage lending, and lender liability issues. The presenter for today's program is Terry Mendenhall. Terry is a banking and financial services executive with over 40 years of experience in mortgage lending and real estate work nationwide. He has led the residential lending operation for various size banking organizations in diverse markets with very different customers. During his career, he has worked for community-based state laws and national financial firms. Asset sizes of the firms ranged from $50 million to $65 billion. Mr. Mendenhall has written articles that were published in various professional publications and served as a speaker at numerous industry meetings involving residential lending and real estate over many years. He's worked with financial institutions nationwide on numerous financial challenges. During the presentation, we will take two question and answer breaks. If you have a question, please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature, both located on the right-hand side of the screen, to submit your questions to the presenter. We encourage attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I'll send out a link with I'll send out I'll send out the link to the archived recording of the webinar, and we do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar is over. I'm now going to turn the program over to our distinguished presenter, Terry Mendenhall. Terry, the program is now all yours. Thank you, Matt. Welcome to everybody. Um, as Matt outlined, this is a seminar in emerging trends in mortgage litigation. Uh, many of you have followed some of the mortgage litigation in the press recently. Uh, not normally a source of lots of litigation, the mortgage world was ground zero in the collapse of the world economy that started in about 2007. As a result, many people lost huge sums of money and litigation is growing significantly. Investors are suing sellers of mortgage investments or mortgage-backed securities. Mortgage-backed bond issuers are suing originators and services, servicers of mortgages. These are contract disputes mostly. Individual borrowers and servicers are also suing each other in collections and foreclosure actions. Some of these are contractual, some are procedural, and some are over trade practices of firms and loan personnel. <clears throat> Mortgage underwriting standards changed dramatically from 1990 to 2007. Subprime and what were called all-day mortgages became higher-risk mortgages and brought many new unqualified people into home ownership, and those loans are now called non-prime mortgages. Mortgage loans or mortgage-backed securities are sold and certain representations and warranties are provided to investors. 
If these covenants are breached, it can be grounds for a demand to repurchase or buy back the loans or securities from an investor. Fraud and misrepresentation are prevalent in non-prime loans because of the use of misstatements or omissions of income or assets in processing and underwriting of the loan. <clears throat> Over 10 years ago, mortgage bankers began using a system called MERS, M-E-R-S, stands for the Mortgage Electronic Registry System, to record transfers of ownership of mortgages. Mortgages can be sub subsequently transferred after the original sale of the mortgage and the, and the transfer of the property rights um, and the new mortgage is, is put on the property. Mortgage bankers began using the system in the late 1990s. This new process replaced the original process of physically recording transfers of the ownership of the deed of trust or mortgage in the county where the original mortgage was recorded against the borrower's property. Apparently, this new system broke down due to volume. Electronic transfer records are missing. Mortgage servicers, in many cases, cannot prove ownership of the mortgage to the courts in order to foreclose. Millions of loans are impacted. The transfer of transactions can be recreated, but it will take time for millions of loans. Some servicers are refinancing the debt with favorable terms to shortcut this process if the borrowers can pay and will agree. Credit scoring has become a popular way for lenders to summarize the creditworthiness of consumer borrowers. It was implemented into the mortgage business over 15 years ago. However, an over-dependence on credit scores can create poor loan quality. Credit scores do not measure income, job stability, assets, down payment, or the character of the borrowers. All are needed for long-term financing decisions. Credit scores can be manipulated in the short run Lenders can be held liable for poor loan products which are not properly explained to borrowers, lack of due diligence regarding the property being mortgaged, collection practices, and deceptive trade practices with borrowers and investors in sales transactions in many states. There's a long history of quality and prudent underwriting of mortgages. Lenders began to take greater and greater risks with the creation of subprime mortgage products in the early 1990s. By the early 2000s, corruptions of the corruption of the prime market with the non-prime features of subprime and all pay loans was occurring through a lack of ethics and greed that drove the market. Continuing the mortgage underwriting history, the volumes of poor quality loans increased significantly and ultimately caused the collapse of the world economy. And most of us have read about that and see it every day on the news. <coughs> there are remedies for investors that purchase non-prime mortgages or mortgage-backed securities. Not only are the non-prime and prudent loans a possible breach of the contract, <coughs> excuse me, but usually the contract does not allow any loans that were delinquent at the time of the sale to be included. Many of the non-prime loans sold were delinquent at the time of their sale into the secondary market or when the mortgage-backed bonds were sold. The foreclosure crisis has added a whole new area of litigation, and I went through that earlier, but uh, this, um, this is kind of the most recent news in all this mortgage litigation. The current environment, uh, litigation and mortgages is growing. There's extremely large cases that are surfacing as well as thousands of smaller cases. Some of these cases have already gone on for nearly two years. <coughs> litigation doesn't just impact the investors, the borrowers, the originators, and the seller servicers of mortgages, but it's, as pointed out earlier, other real estate financing entities get caught up in this net. The loan officers, the real estate brokers, the closing agents, the home builders, the mortgage insurers, the bond insurers. Uh, there's cases that I've seen involving many of these types of firms and, and people. Okay, so um, we're at the first point for Q&A. Um, Matt, do we have some questions here? 
Um, yeah, we do. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you kind of went through that first section very quickly. Um, we may want to go back and spend some more detail. I don't know if you hit every point on, on those slides. Um, but here's a question. Uh, what's the difference in a subprime, a, a subprime versus a non-prime mortgage loan? Subprime and what I called Alte are all included in what is now called non-prime mortgages. At the time these mortgages were being originated, it started its development in the subprime world. Um, subprime was intended to create a category of loan to people with impaired credit. In other words, low credit scores. That was the way of tracking them. Uh, Alte became a way of approving people with better credit but ended up using very poor underwriting techniques that <clears throat> many of which had been used in the subprime world. Um, as people have studied both these types of loans, they saw that they traveled on a spectrum. <clears throat> there was no solid definition for either of these loans when you went from lender to lender. <clears throat> and um, so they all became called non-prime. Um, they didn't fit the guidelines that had been used, used previously, either for credit or other types of underwriting. And many of them used stated income and stated assets versus actual verification of income and assets. So they brought in a lot of uh, people that uh, couldn't otherwise qualify for a mortgage. And I've seen as high as a 50% default rate on some of these portfolios not long after the loans were made. Terry, on uh, slide four of your presentation, you talk about uh, the mortgage underwriting history, and you talk about the late 90s as being, it seems like, as being a real turning point um, with an over-reliance on uh, credit scoring. Um, can you talk about some of the things that were done by some of these financing companies to qualify um, borrowers for the various types of mortgage instruments that were out there on the marketplace? Sure. Um, the summary of, of all lending uh, at that time, as people discussed it, wanted to focus on credit scores and loan-to-value ratios, the loan divided by the value or, the, or the, the property contract amount that it was being purchased for. And... You know, an 80% loan to value was considered the standard with a 20% down payment. <clears throat> Historically, anything over that amount um, um, in loan to value ratio, in other words, a 90 or a 95 or even 100% loan, had to have some other form of guarantee. Well, to maintain an LTV of 80%, some of these lenders made second mortgages up to 100% of value. And that was not using the same underwriting criteria that previously mortgage insurers and FHA and VA had used to ensure or guarantee the amount of the debt above the 80%. And, um, and so that was the first criteria that was implemented with some of these higher risk loans. Um, <clears throat> many of these borrowers had high credit scores, but they never bought a house before. A high credit score can be based on, um, you know, somebody having a credit card balance. Um, of three or four thousand dollars and making their payment on time and maybe having a car loan, but you go from a, a car loan of perhaps twenty five thousand and a credit card balance of three thousand to a mortgage in many cases of five hundred thousand and then add to that the fact that they didn't have to verify their income and they had people misstating what their incomes were or even what their jobs were because these loans did not have a requirement to verify income or assets. They just looked at the LTV and the credit score <clears throat> and said if um, the LTV is 80% or less and the credit score is uh, 700 above, it must be a, an A-quality loan. And the subprime had already pioneered the area of the less than 700 credit scores, but it also started to implement some of these techniques of less verification of income or assets. <clears throat> so over time... This all day became the corruption of what had been the prime market and therefore became part of this non-prime problem. When people first looked at the subprime world as the cause of this, they said, how can it cause such a collapse in the economy when only 
15 to 20 percent at the most of the total loan production for a three or four year period had been registered as subprime. Well, the reason was that they were creating this non-prime world that was corrupting the prime business also. And so <clears throat> there's some estimates that the non-prime part of mortgage lending got up to 50 percent of loan originations for about a four or five year period. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Karen who asks, do you think the pending litigation between investors and the loan sellers is inhibiting modification of these loans, especially regarding principal reduction? Say that again? Sure. We have a question here from Karen. Do you think that the pending litigation between investors and the loan sellers is inhibiting modification of these loans, especially regarding principal reduction? I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm just not sure on that point. Um, there's many that ask the question continuously of why <clears throat> the older loan won't reduce principal uh, for the borrowers. Um, they feel contractually they're owed the money. Um, <clears throat> and this can be in the form of the servicer who holds the servicing and has the rights to service and negotiate with the borrower. <coughs> it can be coming from the investor themselves saying, I'm not going to reduce my debt. Uh, this is what you owe me. Um, I guess there's a lot of different reasons, but the fact is it just hasn't happened to any great extent. And historically it's not happened, but historically we've never had this kind of crisis before where there's been this many <clears throat> loans that were in default. Um, it would seem a foregone conclusion that if you have an asset on your books that's worth a lot less than what you paid for it, um, you're better to value it properly and um, and adjust. And, and if that involves um, a principal reduction to the borrower, ultimately, then that might be the way to go. Um, but many servicers and many lenders and many <clears throat> investors have resisted this um, this particular move. Um, it, my experience is it takes a long time to foreclose on property, uh, and sometimes the investor or the servicer are better off if they can negotiate with the person who's living in the property and pay, can pay something, uh, provided they're still employed and all those kind of things, than they are if they want to go the foreclosure route. But foreclosures have been stymied for many of these um, servicers, and so everybody's kind of an impasse right now. Okay, great. Thank you, Terry. We have a question here from Dorothy who asks, does a title company or a mortgage holder who subsequently attempted to assign a mortgage to another entity owe any duty to a tenant of a piece of foreclosed property to disclose fraud in the transaction on the part of the lender, borrower, and or the title company? That's one for your attorney. <laughs> That's a pretty complicated question. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Okay, we have a question here from Russell who asks. Um, he does uh, some more mor some mortgage foreclosure defense and regularly spot signs on um, on mortgage fraud, usually on the part of uh, the mortgage broker or borrower, with a healthy dose of. Uh, willful blindness on the part of lenders. Um, he says that he believes the problem <clears throat> is bringing a cross-claim is that by the time um, the client interacts with him, the claims are barred. Uh, do you have any suggestions for how a claimant might uh, pursue a claim and, and not get it barred? Not if it's statutory. I mean, uh, in some states, I assume you can go to the court for relief. <clears throat> but um, it, um, if that's the law, I don't know how to go around it. Again, maybe um, a lawyer in the transaction could craft a way to do that. Okay, another question here from uh, Dorothy who asks, are there any claims a renter can assert against an entity claiming to be the holder of a mortgage by virtue of a robo-signed? signer assignment when the entity tries to foreclose on a home 
and there's clear fraud in involved in the mortgage origination. Do you see robo signing, or have you seen robo signing as a uh, as a prevalent act? And uh, and and how can uh, is there any recourse for when robo signing is involved with the transaction, Terry? Well, the, I think again the only recourse is going to be through the courts, and the courts are the ones that discovered this. Um, <clears throat> I I have not encountered any robo signing myself, except in the press art, press articles I've read. <clears throat> but I knew, do know there was there was one judge who was um, quite vocal about the lack of ethics on the part of lawyers that would um, robo sign documents verifying that um, they had the proper ownership <clears throat> evidence, and it turned out they didn't. Um, and as far as I know, that slowed things down considerably. I don't know that there's been a large incident of robo signing since the court started to get involved, but that's that's the place to litigate uh, based on robo signing. Uh, it really came up when, again, in a foreclosure action, and they're in <coughs> judicial foreclosure states. The the entity doing the foreclosing on the property has to prove to the court that they have the right to foreclose. And to do that, they have to produce the documents <clears throat> that show evidence of transfer of ownership to that entity. And um, they had robo-signed um, that they had done this, and, and they didn't. When, when asked for the proper evidence, as I understand the case, they didn't have it. And that's when the judge became quite angry over this and that an attorney would attest to the fact that they had documents that they did not. And state law in in those states, as I understand it, requires that you have evidence before you can foreclose, and I would think that's the case in every state. Okay. Uh, in your experience um, in this area, um, I go back to slide number five where you say that in 2006, subprime represented uh, 15 to 20 percent of the mortgage market and then uh, non-prime and corrupted prime loans were probably 50% of the loans originated. Um, in your experience, what have you seen as kind of the biggest obstacles for unwinding um, these these um, these loans um, in a timely manner? Well, my experience has primarily been in lawsuits between the, <clears throat> the seller of the mortgage and the investor in the mortgage, and... Um, the way to unwind it is through the original contract where those loans were sold, these reps and warranties that I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> those reps and warranties usually provide for a prudent standard of underwriting, um, legal and proper documents, um, and that becomes <clears throat> the argument whether the loans were prudent and whether they were according to industry standards. Um, and then as you get into bond indenture agreements, the same types of things, but even stronger contracts exist on what the the person or the entity who assembles the mortgages that go into a bond, a mortgage-backed bond, has to attest to and qualify all the mortgages based on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, loans can't be delinquent, and yet I've seen many cases where delinquent loans were put into pools that were sold uh, either in bonds or uh, as whole loans through a contract. And that was again right. Oh, sorry. And and what would what and what would some of those industry standards be that you mentioned in your response? Like what what are some of the what are best practices or what documents need to be part of um of loan origination that weren't part of many of these sub subprime or non prime loans that were written? Um, in the late 90s and the uh, early to middle part of the 2000s? Well, for 50 years, um, <clears throat> prior to the time that this uh, event occurred, uh, there was pretty much an accepted notion in the business <clears throat> of what a, a prime mortgage was and, um, and what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. And anything that was not acceptable or different than standards had to be clearly defined. Um, but when you just define something as um, non-conforming, let's say non-conforming used to mean that it was a loan that did not meet the the um, 
loan limit standards of the government agencies, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. That's generally what um, that term meant, nonconforming. It sometimes meant nonconforming as to underwriting, but those underwriting standards had to be clarified and substantiated in the contract. <clears throat> I have seen contracts where that didn't exist. There was no definition of what the loans in the pool were going to represent or how they were going to be un underwritten. And normally when lawyers write documents, they provide a pretty clear set of definitions. So there's no misunderstanding on what's being sold and what's being purchased. We have a question here from uh, Russell Wesk. Um What do you see as the optimal goal of valuing mortgage-backed securities? Um, <laughs> personally, it's it, there's probably a greed factor involved. Um, people don't want to admit that what the value is really is, and so they've kept it higher than what it normally um, <clears throat> would be put at. Um, that's that's a major obstacle that I see. Um, if you've got the asset valued on your books at um, ninety thousand and it's actually only worth sixty, and you don't admit that sixty thousand is the value times however many loans you have, um, then uh, that's an obstacle. <clears throat> Okay, we have a question here from Karen who asks, um, can a borrower enforce these representations and warranties in a case against the lender as third-party beneficiary of the terms and conditions of the pooling and servicing agreement as to the actual ownership of the note being transferred to the trust? Um, I'd ask a lawyer, but I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> that's a contract between the... The seller and the purchaser of the loans, it doesn't involve the borrower. And the borrower complied with whatever guidelines they were given. <clears throat> um, they weren't aware of what was being told to a, a purchaser of that loan subsequent to the loan being made. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question here. Um, that ask, um, if, who do you think is to, uh, or I should, I should phrase this differently, um, what, what, what could have been done to avoid, um, the writing of these bad loans, um, whether they be subprime, all pay, non-prime, um, were there industry standards that were not followed and that should have been followed and, um, what, could you identify some of the things that um, were not enforced or followed by, by these lenders? Well, at the time, you had a largely unregulated sec segment of the market in mortgage brokers and mortgage bankers and investment banks. <clears throat> they weren't regulated by the banking um, regulators. Uh, they weren't regulated on these facts by the SEC. I, I believe a lot of that's been tightened up, but some believe not enough so. Um, there were industry standards, and in general, it was the standards of the government agencies, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, <clears throat> and, um, and Jenny Mae included FHA and VA. Um, and generally, they had been making loans the same way for 30 or 40 years. Um, the two conventional loan agencies, Fannie and Freddie, are under a lot of scrutiny right now because they began to violate these standards also, um, some of their own standards. <clears throat> As you follow the press, um, and I do, and, and based on my experience, they were little, literally the followers and not the leaders. The, the impetus for this, in my opinion, came from Wall Street that drove the subprime market and expanded the, the, the world into buying mortgage-backed securities of all types. And that had never been done before in any large-scale volume until the late 1990s. And so the funding was driving the creation of non-prime mortgages. Okay, 
Okay, great. Well, why don't we continue on with the uh, presentation of content. We have a couple questions that have been coming in here, so let's get to them. Uh, we have a question from Edmund who asks, can Terry discuss the implications of filing a bankruptcy on behalf of the debtors on the mortgage modification process? Once a debtor has his personal obligation to the bank discharged, is the bank more inclined to approve a modification to try to get the debtor back on, on the hook, similar to a reaffirmation of debt? Depends on the lender. I mean, it's a it's an individual decision, and you'll you'll find that vary from lender to lender, to lender. I would think. What is your what has been your experience um, with with lenders and and with cases that you have seen? Um, is this more the practice, or is this the exception? What what techniques have you seen implemented? Um, I haven't seen any standard to speak of. I mean. <clears throat> There's been a huge reluctance on the part of lenders to settle up on anything, and um, they tend to want the property back uh, in all cases, and that's kind of a historical <clears throat> position. Lenders have always wanted to foreclose as opposed to do workouts, um, but lenders have never faced this kind of volume of foreclosures before, and they're having to modify their their um, their policies and procedures on the fly, and some have changed, some have changed greatly, some have not changed at all. But in general, historically, lenders have wanted to foreclose on the property, uh, regardless of, of whether it's, you know, trying to negotiate prior to a bankruptcy or after a bankruptcy, <clears throat> they're, they want the property back. Does that hold true with the amount of volume that you referenced um, earlier in your presentation, um, even though they, they've not seen this, this amount of volume of foreclosures and workouts, they still want to uh, to get their hands on the property at some point during the process? Uh, that's my perception, but it's I'm not in there talking to the lenders every day, so I'm where they are at this point in time, I can't tell you. Um, everything's based on individual lender, individual discussion, but uh, the process hasn't worked very well. You've had this uh, big uh, freeze in foreclosures that's occurred nationwide. You've had uh, the largest concentration of servicing that we've ever seen historically. I mean, historically, there's always been more local lenders and local servicers, but the consolidation of servicing began in the, in the mid-1980s, and there's literally large blocks of servicing that are being serviced by a very few lenders now, and and it's nationwide. It's a nationwide business, and um, that's why you see many of these cases uh, occurring in federal courts as opposed to uh, state courts. Uh, it's because it's, a, it's an interstate commerce issue when there's a dispute, but um, when you have that large of a servicing entity, they have to divide up the task, and you see uh, many cases where borrowers say the borrowers say I can't talk to the same person when I when I talk to one collector and we make a deal, then I call back that collector's not there it's somebody else he doesn't have record of the transaction their own operating systems don't work these are the things that I hear and read all the time so you know the system generally was a mess uh, because it was not geared to handle the kind of volume of default that was occurring and it was a large system to begin with in a nationwide entity. Okay, great. Uh, we have a couple more questions here um, from Daniel. Have you ever heard, have you had any experience with violation of New Jersey's uh, Fair Foreclosure Act? And if so, what penalties have the courts employed? No, I have not. Not familiar with that. Um, and then Joseph asked, when is your court to foreclose Oh, Joseph just uh, was entering a com uh, comment. I, I apologize. Uh, Thomas asked um, if, if, if he has a Wells Fargo loan number, how can he find out the particulars of, this, of the pool this loan became part of? Or how can I learn to identify the institutional investor if the services refuse to, to disclose this information? So if mortgages were packaged... Um, 
and in a pool, how, how can people identify what loans are part of that package or that pool? What would be the purpose of having that knowledge? I mean, what's the benefit to the borrower in knowing it? I believe this uh, attorney may represent borrowers or a, bar a particular borrower in this matter. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, you'd have to, you'd have to go to court, and to go to court, you'd have to tell the court why you need the information, why it's important, what you think you could do with it. Um, I'm not sure what a borrower can do with that information. I would that be something that you would need if you were working on one of these cases? Um. I don't think so. I mean, my experience is, as I said earlier, is more between the investors and the and the, um, the seller of the loan. Um, but uh, in these foreclosure actions, they're in district court. Um, it's usually a foreclosure action, and if it's a judicial foreclosure state um, where you go before the judge, uh, there's you know it's. There's a certain process that has to be followed. If, if in that process there's an opportunity to, to ask for information that you're not getting that has value to your client uh, and you can prove it, I would think that the court would listen. But not being familiar with all the foreclosure laws in every single state, um, I know in general what's, uh, what's done nationwide, but uh, it just depends on the court and the state laws. and and what the value of that information is and what its use would be to the to the borrowers who's who's trying to stop the foreclosure. Uh, we have clarification here from Thomas who was asking that question. Um, he says the borrower wants to see the disclosures made to the investor in the perspective. This this information could give rise uh, to a fraud cause of action. That's why they're they're possibly interested in getting this information. Well, uh, again, I think you'd have to go to the court to ask for that. Um, but there's a difference in, in fraud between the, the seller and the investor and fraud that occurred between the, the borrower and the initial lender. Um, and you got to look at the difference in those two and, and are there differences and there, are there similarities to see if they're the same or separate issues. Can you expand a little bit on that? What 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 are the differences? Well, fraud between the borrower and the lender might be that the borrower has um, stated their income and it's untrue. Um, they've um, so they've misstated their income. They've perhaps committed fraud. Um, if the lender has not disclosed the full terms of the loan to the um, borrower, then it could be fraud in the reverse. I mean, or misrepresentation or deceptive practices. Um, if the loan was an arm and it was disclosed as a fixed rate loan, I would think that's deceptive. Um, it's an error, but if it was an intentional error, it's, it's deceptive. Um, there are certain disclosure laws that require disclosures to be made on the type of loan and, and what the terms are. Um, and then, um, you know, the closing costs and all those kind of things, those are all designed to protect the borrower from practices of the lender. Um, but what was the transaction between the seller of the loan and the investor of the loan are maybe a whole different set of circumstances. Uh, in other words, if the, the seller of the loan said these are prime loans and they fit the definition of prime and they fit that industry standard and they're prudent and the investor can prove that they were not and they did not meet the standard of that contract, I don't think that impacts the borrower. Okay, great. Why don't we all the talk terms as quoted by the lender? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, why don't we continue on with the presentation of content? Okay. Uh, we'll pick up on the page mark.
future, which I'll take us to right now. Future, again, all these bullets uh, cover various details, but uh, they outline that I think litigation will continue until all these issues are resolved. Um, there's already been tougher regulation of banks, mortgage banks, and investment entities, as well as more prudent standards of mortgage under underwriting that have been implemented. And I think this will probably continue until this pendulum swings too far the other direction. Unfortunately, that's the nature of um, laws and regulations is when a big problem occurs, the, the whole fire department comes in and tries to put out the fire, and then they build all kinds of regulations, and people say, well, you went too far, and then they have to try to soften that over time. But um, we're still implementing tougher standards, but the standards are tougher than what they used to be. I think credit scoring will only be part of the underwriting decision. Um, as I said, regulations increasing, uh, financial services, services firms and banks will be held accountable in the future, and borrowers will find themselves owing deficiency judgments after foreclosures unless they declare bankruptcy. Uh, deficiency judgments haven't been seen in quite a while. Uh, you you kind of have to go through a uh, foreclosure cycle to see them appear, but um, if there is um, a difference between the amount that is foreclosed and the original loan, the lender has a right to record a deficiency judgment. And um, even though the property is disposed of and the REO is sold, there's a judgment that occurs against that individual <coughs> or two individuals if they were a couple buying that um, after foreclosure um, in the county where the um, – the home existed, but deficiency judgments can be moved if um, if lenders choose to do so. It's a cumbersome process, but sometimes it's the only way where lenders can ultimately collect on a debt. And I've seen cases where 10 years after the fact, um, somebody comes in to settle a deficiency judgment. And so there will be a larger volume of the de these deficiency judgments that occur uh, with foreclosures. And uh, uh, that last bullet point, I think you're seeing, let me go back to it, um, you're seeing this is that the seller servicers are going to be asked to retain a certain percentage of loan balances sold so that they maintain an investment in loans that they both originate and sell. And there's a lot of discussion about this, but this seems like a prudent action when so many loans are sold into the secondary market and around the world that, you know, unless the the entity that made the loan originally has to retain an investment in it. They're uh, less likely to care once they've sold the balance to somebody else. Okay. Next place for Q&A. Okay. Terry, uh, with regard to the future uh, that you just talked about, um, what has occurred since the uh, the crash happened uh, with lending standards and documentation and stuff like that? Can you give us kind of a for, uh, before and after picture? What was happening before and what is happening now when uh, mortgages are mortgages are written, uh, bundled, and uh, sold? Well, it's um, it's been extremely hard for people to get financing on homes if they buy a home. I mean, they really have to meet a higher credit standard test. Um, I don't believe there's uh, a world called subprime anymore. <clears throat> I don't think there's many loans that are made without verification of income or assets, and I think there's an awful lot of scrutiny of even the best loans today, because uh, I hear about that constantly, that it's just tougher and tougher for people to get financing because lenders are so cautious. Uh, so that tells me that underwriting standards have changed a lot. In addition, um, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank bill um, about, I think it was about 18 months ago. That's still being debated on implementation. There's a lot that the banking regulators have to figure out to be able to implement parts of it, but the lobbyists are fighting it tooth and nail for <clears throat> banks and mortgage banks and mortgage brokers. They feel like the pendulum has already swung too far. Um, that's a process. I mean, you just have to let that take a hold, but um, until that legislation is fully implemented, you won't know. And just because you pass a bill, it can take years before the, the total uh, bill is implemented 
because of many of the provisions, and that's what's happening right now is that some of it got implemented right away. It changed underwriting standards for many entities, but then there were a lot of regulations that had to be written, <coughs> and I saw just today that um, uh, Representative Frank made the comment to the banking regulators that, you know, there was no penalty if they didn't issue regulations by a certain date that they need to take their time to get it right. Um, but I don't believe he believes or other members of Congress believe that they should back off. It's just if you need more time, spend time to write the legislation. Um, but as I said, the lobbyists are after it tooth and nail, so it's just um, you just have to wait to see. Okay, great. We have a question here from Bill who asks, uh, what impact do you see as a result of the change in loan officer loan officer compensation that took effect the 1st of April of this year? Well, the main emphasis is um, <clears throat> loan officers have to be compensated on volume or other criteria that are important to the firm as opposed to the profitability of a single loan. Um, some of the subprime mortgage shift and non-prime mortgage shift was driven by the fact that those loans individually were more profitable to the lenders. And so anybody on the borderline <coughs> in many firms got shifted automatically to a higher credit risk type loan where they didn't verify assets or income or anything else because the lender was going to make more money, the loan officer was going to make more money, and it was easier to do. And so that that part of regulation is taking hold. Um, are we going to a perfect world? No. And everybody's got to make tons of changes, which are going to be difficult. <coughs> but um, driving the commission by the individual profitability of the loan, which has nothing to do with the um, – service to the customer or the borrower uh, necessarily is um, is not always a good thing. Okay, great. And do you think that that will have a, obviously that will have a positive impact, but do you think that will also um, make it more difficult for people to, uh, or limit the amount of people that go into um, the loan officer uh, position at a bank? Maybe. Um, I'm not sure that's a bad thing either. Um, <clears throat> if there's fewer loans being made, do we need as many loan officers? Um, and that's a valid question. <clears throat> um, we we aren't in the business to just employ people. We're in, in the business to serve customers should be the, the mission here. And um, if the number of customers to service is less than it used to be, you probably don't need, need as many loan officers. You probably don't need to pay as high a commission to get those those loans. Do you, do you see, um, in your experience uh, down in Texas, that um, you were saying that it's more difficult to qualify for financing? Um, is there more paperwork now required? Um, more documentation? Um, how how are those sorts of things being enforced under the new? Uh, state and federal regulations? Um, well, invariably, there's more paperwork. If you don't have a streamlined type loan that doesn't force you to verify assets and income or look as closely at an appraisal, um, you're going to have more documentation. And that's just the bottom line. But <clears throat> when we, when the business created those loans, they were making loans to people that <clears throat> didn't really qualify. Many of those people wouldn't have been in the housing market otherwise, and they couldn't pay the debt otherwise. So did we really do anybody a favor by making loans to people that couldn't afford it? <clears throat> and um, these loans were not just about disadvantaged people. Um, you know, the creation of this market has been um, been blamed on housing policy that wanted everybody in a home, uh, especially the economically disadvantaged. But uh, I've seen million, many million-dollar loans in pools of mortgages that were made under the non-prime arena. <clears throat> and the, the whole effort was to get a loan to somebody that had no business buying a property like that. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier, uh, somebody that has a $500 
balance on a MasterCard and a $5,000 or $25,000 loan on a car is not necessarily qualified for a $500,000 mortgage. <coughs> but if the loan officer tells them or they, they, they conclude on their own that, well, if I just tell this person I make $150,000 a year and they aren't going to have to verify it, I guess that's the world that we're in. And those people aren't going to be able to pay the debt. And you multiply that times millions of loans, and you've got an economic crisis that's hard to solve. <laughs> hey, we have a question here from John who asks, with limited financing, stricter guidelines, a large pool of unsold foreclosed inventory, what's your prediction on what's going to give to enable the market to build some momentum in financing, real estate sales, true valuation, et cetera, et cetera? Well, you have to clear the inventory, obviously. You've got to move the foreclosures through the market. Um, there's signs that this is starting to happen in many markets. Um, I heard a fact at a seminar not too long ago where somebody said that 55% uh, of all the foreclosures in the country are occurring in less than 60 counties in the United States. So... When you think about that, when I thought about it, it tells me that real estate is always a local issue. Um, the numbers are so huge, <clears throat> you add them all together, and <clears throat> there's lots of people that live in these terrible markets, and it affects their market. But if you don't live in those terrible markets, and you're, you, then you're not as impacted by real estate values, um, it doesn't matter as much to somebody in San Antonio, Texas, what the real estate values are in Southern California, unless they're moving from Southern California to San Antonio or vice versa. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the queue, but you can still uh, continue to send them in. Uh, Terry, do you want to um, use a little bit of time here to summarize your presentation and, and some of the questions that have come in? Sure. Um, good questions. Um, most of them I were hearing were on the borrower side of the equation. Um, there's this whole area of lit litigation that I mentioned between the investors and the and the sellers of these mortgages. Uh, those those are probably the larger cases right now. But I understand that the borrower litigation um, <coughs> involves millions of people, and um, some may result in in class actions and things like that that we become very big cases also. Um, I've got kind of a summary here about what lawyers should do when considering litigation for clients. Um, number one, just like you do in any litigation, you got to make a decision whether you're on the plaintiff side or the defense side with this case. Um, decide what the dispute is about, and then get qualified assistance, both legal and with experts, it's a highly technical and specialized area of business and law, and many lawyers and firms are not capable of handling all the way through. I've seen firms that handle it up to a certain point and then and then provide the case to a litigation firm or a litigator um, to go, take it on through. But uh, many experts also may have conflicts, um, so you have to look at those issues. Sometimes lawyers have contact, conflicts. If they're a business lawyer and they've started the case for a client, um, I, I'm aware of one case where the business lawyer was going to be called as a witness and then had to transfer the case to another firm. So <clears throat> that's an issue. And then decide if the jurisdiction should be a state or federal court. Uh, also look for contract requirements for mediation or arbitration of, of disputes. Uh, sometimes that exists, um, and you want to know that right up front. So those are kind of some issues I, I think that lawyers should consider. Um, as they evaluate this type of litigation. Okay, great, Terry. We did have a question that came in, or two questions that came in uh, while you were uh, summarizing. So if you don't mind uh, answering these two. First one comes from Anthony who asks, um, uh, can you talk about individuals who submitted false data and what recourse uh, mortgage lenders have for this fraud or this, um, this issue? Well, <clears throat> the lawyer that represents them should get a copy of the loan application and read 
the fine print before their signature because it states that, uh, you know, any misstatement, uh, material or otherwise, um, could be grounds for a federal perjury um, referral to the U.S. Attorney. Okay, we have a question here from Russell, um, which goes back to the uh, Merge Back Security uh, question that was asked a little while ago. Um, he, uh, he understands that there, there may be uh, many factors that keep underlying collateral value at market value um, at the time of loan origination, but how is the loan or tranche of the loan valued um, in the marketplace at this time? It's whatever the financial policy is of the entity that holds it. Um, <clears throat> and if they're governed by AICPA rules, um, I'm not current on those, but one of the cautions I have there is that <clears throat> one of the items that was considered to be a prime loan with, that got a different evaluation than a subprime loan was just the credit score on the loan. <clears throat> and I mentioned the the fallacy of using credit scores. So I don't know if the accounting profession is fully up to speed on this, but if they're, if the accountant uh, or the accounting firm is evaluating these assets based on just the credit scores of the loans, uh, I would question that practice. It's just not prudent because, as I mentioned, many of the non-prime loans that have high credit scores, you know, have up to a 50% default rate. So they don't deserve a higher valuation. Okay, we have a question here from Stewart who asks, um, and this is a question that deals with uh, commercial mortgages versus residential uh, mortgage. But many times the property owners uh, purchase the premise to reside in along with tenants. Does this qualify them in any way to raise the same challenges on the commercial mortgages as you outlined in residential mortgages. Are the issues the same in commercial and residential, or are there unique issues um, in both? Uh, some are similar and some are different. <clears throat> um, you know, if, if it's a office condominium project where the loans were originated using residential lending documents, <clears throat> um, there's some similarities there. But, you know, whether you follow residential lending guidelines or commercial lending guidelines, <clears throat> the lender has to evaluate the, 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 the entity that's making the loan. Um, and so it, it just depends on, you know, the circumstances, the type of property, the type of borrower, uh, the type of guidelines that were used. Okay, great. We have a question here uh, from Lisa who asks, have you seen an increase in adversarial actions against debtors in bankruptcy due to fraudulent statements of income? If, if so, what have you seen as a success rate to make a deficiency judgment in a foreclosure non-dischargeable due to fraudulent information? Um, I was merely predicting that we would see more deficiency judgments. I don't know if that's the case or not. I uh, just know based on experience that <clears throat> as property values decline and lenders finally sell the property after foreclosure and realize there's a loss there, they're going to try to cover their <clears throat> their problem with bidding less at the at the foreclosure option than what the debt is, creating a deficiency or actually another opportunity is to actually move the property at foreclosure to somebody else who wants to buy it so that they don't have to turn around and refurbish it and sell it that way. So it's a strategy for foreclosure that I think lenders will implement if they haven't already, but I'm I'm not current on whether they have or not. Okay, we have a question here from John, and this will probably be our final question of the afternoon. Uh, from the investor side, how do you evaluate uh, your specific investment interest considering a servicer agreement, borrower agreement, and the basic inability to identify all the potential purchasers in a, mer in a, mer a mortgage backed security in a particular loan pool? 
Well, somewhere there's a list of loans that went into that pool. Uh, whether you bought a tranche or whether you bought the <coughs> an undivided interest in an entire pool of mortgages, somewhere there's a list of loans uh, in that pool, and through that you can require information, I would think, to um, reveal what what the application information looks like, what the underwriting looks like, and all those kind of things that will be required through um, the litigation process. Now, Terry, would that information be uh, with the government agency like the FCC, or would it be with a uh, with third party? Where where would you first look for that sort of information? Well, it's going to depend on the type of bond that was issued and when it was issued, I would think. But um, <clears throat> it for sure exists with the servicer of the mortgages, um, and if you're if you're suing the servicer, um, you could require it through the discovery process. I I would think. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you for a great presentation, and to those who attended, thank you for all of your great questions. Um, I'd like to just wrap up today's presentation very briefly. Um, first of all, as I said, I want to thank everybody for taking the, the time to spend with us uh, this afternoon. If you'd like to speak with Terry about a particular case or project, um, you can call us here at PASA. Our number is 800-523-2319, or you can email me at tamhide at com. We will be sending out a link uh, to the archived recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. And the archived recording of this webinar, as well as all of our past webinars, are posted in the Past and Knowledge Center. Just go to our homepage, pastnet.com, click on the Knowledge Center tab located at the top of the page, and you'll see a link for our webinars. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, please send me an email at mhide at .com. I appreciate everybody's comments, and it helps us to produce better programs. So please, please send me um, any feedback that you may have. There's going to be a survey that appears on your screen when you leave the meeting. Please take a moment or two to fill that out for us. Again, that helps us um, produce better programs. And we hope to see you at future PASA events. Thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing you here in the future. Thank you, everybody.